Hey everyone, so um, this year, or like not this year, <laughs> I really feel as if my year has just started clearly. This month I'm going to try things a little bit differently when it comes to my wrap ups so I'm going to be filming them as I go along. I'm a little bit late by a few days because I keep on forgetting to film this clip whenever I have the camera set up for a sit down video. But So I'm going to do it vlog style so after I finish a book I will update you guys and that's that and that I will then cut together at the end of the month. So I have finished my first book of the month, which is The Dragon Republic by R.F. Kuang. So this is the second book in the Poppy War trilogy. Um, I'm as a result not going to say too much about the plot of this one, but so in the Poppy War, we are following Rin, who is um, a young girl who was orphaned during the first two Poppy Wars. And she is taken in by her, some of her like relatives, I believe, but she's basically kind of treated as free help. So she's not really welcomed into the family. She does not feel a part of the family. And so in order to escape this circumstances, but also the fate that they have put aside for her, she uh, decides to study really, really hard in order to gain the top spot on the state exam and be able to enter into a prestigious military academy. And in the first sort of like half of this book, a lot of attention goes into dealing with the aftermath of what has taken place within book one. A lot of it therefore also deals with PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, because of the events that have taken place in book one, the things that Rin has done herself and the things that have been done to her. So I really enjoyed that aspect to the Dragon Republic. It is not a very pleasurable read to some extent because Rin is a very unlikable character, um, which is very much a personal opinion because I do know that there are people who really enjoy Rin as a character as well. For me, Rin is very much an unlikable character. I very much dislike the way that she looks upon things, the decisions that she makes, the way that she's very much stuck in her own mind. To me, Rin is a character who very much lacks empathy and as somebody who is very empathic myself, I kind of find that very difficult to deal with. And so I don't necessarily want good things to happen to Rin, which actually is quite pleasurable because this is not a light and fluffy read. Um, a lot of people have had much heartbreak over the series. I have not yet read The Burning God, so I don't know how I will feel about the ending of this trilogy. But in this second book, there are certain events at the end of this book that kind of shocked people or really made them angry. And for me, this ending ended up being quite okay. So I very much had a great time with this. I very much enjoyed being back in this world. One of the main things that is pleasurable to me in this read is being able to connect the dots between real history and what RF Kuang does with it within this story. It is definitely not a literal transmutation of history into fiction, especially what happens at the end of book one is first of, is first of all a fantastical reimagining of the events in World War One, but also also changes the responsibilities of what has taken place at that point in time in our real history. But so yeah, I enjoyed this one in spite of very much disliking Rin as a character. I still very much had a great time with this one and I'm very much eager to dive into The Burning God, though I am going to wait until next month because I want to make sure that there's some distance between the different books so that I do kind of hopefully remember which part of the storyline belongs to which book. All right, so it's the 13th of July and yesterday I finished another book. So I finished The Book of Night by Holly Black. So this is Holly Black's adult debut. I have not read another Holly Black, so I didn't really know what to expect. I also didn't really look into the premise beforehand neither. So I went in with zero expectations. The Book of Night is basically an adult fantasy story set in our world. So an urban fantasy in which we are following this girl called Charlie Hall or this woman called called Charlie Hall, who is working as a bartender, but she has a past as a sort of like con artist, swindler, thief type of character. But she's kind of turned her back to that life. She wants to live a much more stable, much more safe life. However, at the beginning of the story, she's kind of asked to look into the disappearance of uh, somebody's boyfriend. And as a consequence, she kind of gets sucked into this bigger case again. Now, the only thing that I kind of knew going into it was that it was going to contain shadow magic. And I think the shadow magic is basically my favorite thing about this story. Um, the shadow magic I found really interesting, but you do need to go into it knowing that you won't be fully satisfied to some extent because it very much felt like this shadow magic 
aspect is kind of something that she's dipping into, but you're not fully exposed to all the possibilities and the restrictions and stats are linked to the shadow magic in this first book in any case. So this is definitely going to have a sequel, I believe. In any case, in Goodreads, this is marked as the first book of a series, but I'm not sure whether it's like a duology or a trilogy or anything like that. But so... For me, I enjoyed the shadow magic and I thought enjoyed like looking at the way in which the shadow magic kind of creates the sort of like clandestine business surrounding it in which like people um, pay to have alterations made to their shadows, for example, but also the way in which shadows are stolen in order to then be altered and sold. Basically, in this world, shadows can quicken. And if that happens, your shadow to some extent becomes its own entity. It can kind of do stuff for you. It can kind of um, enter into the minds of other people and make them do certain things, for example. But the full range of possibility of what shadow magic can do is something that we do not really find out. I am expecting that to become more of a thing within the second book, because within this one it does make sense that we stay relatively surface level when it comes to the shadow magic. Since our protagonist is not a shadow mage, nobody in her environment is a shadow mage. There are shadow mages involved within the storyline, but shadow mages are basically all of these sort of like mysterious uh, characters who don't really want to share their secrets. So with the way in which the story developed, I'm pretty sure that within the second one, we're gonna have a lot more experiences with shadow magic. We'll get to see a lot more shadow magic in action, but that was the thing that I enjoyed most. So sadly, that also means that for me, this book turned out to be relatively meh. This also does definitely have to do with the fact that I don't like detective style stories and even though she's not a detective much of this story centers around kind of putting the pieces together cracking the case so to speak and so it does feel like a detective novel at times and so that type of storyline just doesn't really interest me and so as a result for a very big part of it i just wasn't that engaged anymore in terms of its atmosphere i would say that this very much felt like the book equivalent to a film noir so it's a very bleak nihilistic world there isn't much hope in it there's a lot of cynicism there's a lot of corruption so it definitely doesn't feel like a very hopeful place it's kind of a place that's kind of filled more with despair at the same time emotions definitely in general feel kind of more muted so it kind of feels more as if everything is just staying on this sort of like dull gray level i'm not a fan of film noir for example and i also wasn't really a fan of the atmosphere within this book. I have to get used to updating you guys as I go along but so the next book that I finished is A Natural History of Dragons by Mary Brennan which is the first book in a fantasy series. This is historical fantasy kind of taking place around the sort of like Victorian era in which we have this young girl who from a young age on is very much obsessed with anything dragon and so it's kind of going to be her life goal to learn more about dragons and to find a way for her as a woman in this very restrictive society to be able to make this her profession. This is written in a memoir style. It is also called A Memoir by Lady Trent's. I think the series is called like The Memoirs of Lady Trent's. And so in this first one especially we see this sort of like start to her journey as you know her father kind of indicates that if she finds herself a husband who is interested in dragons himself then that at the very least might lead her to be able to explore some of the books about dragons that she has shown an interest in in the past. Now as I said this is told in a memoir style. I think the memoir style works really well. It offers the possibility of having your character be a young, naive, foolish girl with having the elder version of herself give commentary on that. Because this story for a big part also takes place in a culture that is not her own culture, it also allows for her elder self to reflect back on some of the mistakes that she has made in the past in dealing with people who have a different cultural background than herself. I thought it was very enjoyable. I had a great time with this one. This is not an all-time new favorite, but it definitely was a fun ride and I am very much eager to continue on with the series at some point. It is not going to like climb to the top of my priority list, but I do want to continue. Within that project, I then picked up Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. So this is a sci-fi book or more like a horror, specifically cosmic horror, basically type of horror story in which 
none of the answers are really provided. Part of the horror is the unknown. And so within this story, we are looking at an expedition into Area X. Area X is this mysterious area in which weird stuff happens. And all of the past expeditions into Area X haven't really ended well. All members of the past expedition, for example, returned to the outside world at some point, but they never really came back fully. You know, mentally they aren't really returned. And so we are following this new expedition, expedition number 12. And this is an expedition filled with women explorers. We have women from different strands of life. We have a linguist, a psychologist, an anthropologist, a surveyor, and then our protagonist, a biologist. And so they step into Area X and weird stuff starts to happen. Now, I'm not going to say more than that, just because, you know, it's weird stuff and that's really most of the appeal of the story. The appeal lies in the unknown, in exploring this weird new world and trying to kind of figure out what is happening while you will never really get the answers to that. So do know that going in that if you are somebody who needs answers to your questions, if you are somebody who needs to have the answers in order for you to enjoy a story, then this will not be the story for you. Everything remains open and we get no answers and the ending to the story is also very open. It is first of a trilogy but I'm pretty sure that we will not be following the same character in the remainder of the trilogy. Perhaps we will get some answers about her in some of the other books but I'm not sure of that and I don't actually expect that but so yeah I really enjoyed this one a whole lot it as I said it's very much vibes it's very much atmosphere um, and so at first I was kind of struggling a little bit to get into the story but around the 40% section or, or so I was really sucked in and then the final book that at this point I've completed isn't the right word the final one that I've just you know kind of put down is Three Souls by Jenny Chang. This is historical fiction. It is Chinese historical fiction taking place in sort of like the years or maybe even a decade or so before the onset of the Second Sino-Japanese War. In this one we are following our um, protagonist, and I've forgotten the name again, Lei Yin, I think, um, or Lei Fun. In this one we are following our protagonist who at the beginning of this story has just passed away. And in her afterlife her three souls kinda indicate that she's stuck at the moment. She cannot move on because her actions have really screwed up somebody's life and she kinda needs to resolve and she needs to resolve that situation in order for her to move on. As a consequence, we are revisiting her life to figure out where things went wrong because her afterlife self doesn't really have any memories of what her life has been. So this is the way in which we frame the story and we will then move back into the past starting from some point within her childhood when she is about to um, finish high school and wants to move on to university. However, her father needs to approve that. I enjoyed it just fine. But I didn't love it as much as I hoped I was going to love it. And I basically found myself struggling with the framing device. I like framing devices a whole lot. But in this one, I just felt it to be just too gimmicky, too contrived. You know, it didn't feel natural. And the flow of the story to me was constantly interrupted by this framing narrative. Sometimes within the chapters, usually at the end of each chapter, we would move back to the afterlife um, time frame and we would have the three souls give their uh, opinion about the actions that have just taken place in the chapter that we've been reading from but I found that to be quite repetitive and to really flow and to really break up the narrative flow so I didn't enjoy that a whole lot and to some extent I would have kind of preferred to follow a character who understands her position in society better and who while innerly not agreeing with it outwardly following the rules of what tradition requires and things like that. I felt myself being a little bit tired of this perspective. Aside from that, I've read a few other works surrounding this time period, actually more surrounding the time period after the Second Sino-Japanese War, but still. And so my familiarity with the time period just meant that if the other things weren't going to intrigue me, so if the framing narrative and the character that we're following aren't interesting me enough, then the historical framework that I'm already familiar with isn't going to push me through neither. All in all, I just kind of feel like my experience with this book was kind of lackluster because of the fact that I've read multiple Chinese historical works. So I would say if you haven't read much, then 
potentially this can be really a great entry point for you but just for me personally I could kind of feel like it was going to be a waste of my time. All right a few days have passed by I finished another book and I finished The Goblin Emperor by Catherine Addison. So this is a book that I read for the book club of Queens Witches and Valkyries by Sa a book club hosted by Sara from Voyage True Worlds. So this is a book that I actually was least interested to vote on for that month, so I did not vote for it, but in the end I'm quite happy that this one won because I don't think I would have ever picked it up by myself and uh, I ended up being really surprised by this one. So I had quite some prejudices about what a goblin fantasy was going to be like and it was definitely very different from what I expected. I was kind of expecting something like super romance heavy and there is a romance plotline within this one but it's definitely far from being at the center of this story. So in this one we are following Maya who is the fourth son of the king and at the beginning of this story the king and his three eldest sons have just died and so Maya finds himself becoming the successor or becoming the emperor. So as the title indicates he's a goblin, the goblin emperor, he's actually a half goblin and the prejudices or the way in which he is viewed and the way in which he now sees himself because of his goblin heritage will definitely also play a role within this story. So there is definitely racism from the elvish part of the society towards the goblin side of the society. And one of my main criticisms might be that we don't really do too much with that. We see the internalized um, racism that's, that's, that goes along with that and we see certain prejudices from certain characters within this world towards goblins but I would have liked for us to maybe address it a little bit more um, towards the second half of the novel. It very much is a slow burn. I for a very long time did not think that I was invested. I thought that I was just like cruising along I'm having an okay time, I don't really know which the characters from one another, cannot really follow the court intrigue and you know I'm fine with the book but I'm not really loving it and then I found out like wait I'm actually I actually am loving it, I actually am super invested and I love this main character. So this main character is probably my new favorite character for the year so far it probably will remain that way because I absolutely adore him. So he very much is a slow burn because at the beginning of the story we are introduced to him and you know not uh, not all sides of his personality are immediately exposed to us and there are certain wounds from his past that we're kind of introduced to but that we don't fully feel the impact yet of. So they will be explored more throughout the plot and you will start to understand how deep these wounds are and how much they have formed a part of his identity in the way that he sees himself and the way that he acts around people. And so he's very much an anxious being. He very much is somebody with low self-esteem and high levels of anxiety. And he is put into this position of absolute power, absolute reverence. People uh, automatically look up to him or, you know, have to look up to him. Whereas he himself has this sort of like constant negative voice inside his head who's constantly talking down to about him who's constantly talking down to himself. And so a lot of the story is about him slowly gaining confidence as he becomes better and better at court life because he has not been prepared for court life at all. He was a fourth son, he was never expected to take on this position. And aside from that, he was also fallen out of grace and he had been kind of banned and exiled to this faraway part of the kingdom. And so I absolutely fell in love with this one. I definitely need to say that I had some issues with the book as well. So first off is the difficulty of getting into this. It has a sort of like older uh, style of dialogue where you use terminology such as thou, which at the beginning really constantly was taking me out of the story. Though I will say that definitely by the second half of the novel, I wasn't even noticing it anymore. And then the second problem is the names and the terminology. So the naming system is really quite difficult. You do get used to it, but still um, it can cause quite some difficulties in getting immersed in the beginning because, you know, there are different... a word has like different variants. You can have the name, then you have the a variant of that name that refers to the house as a whole, so to the entire people of that family. Um, and then you have the adjective version of that name, for example. So there are different variants of the same 
name and that can sometimes cause problems. Aside from that, there's a title system that is unique to this story. I don't know whether it's close to any sort of real world language or whether it might even be a real world language. Um, but in any case, there are titles being used that to me in any case, I didn't realize they were titles until like a hundred pages in. So I would highly recommend you guys to check out the final section of the novel right before the glossary, which talks about like pronunciation, but also about the naming system and about titles so that you at least definitely in the title one, I think can really help because it says a lot about, first of all, the um, gender of the person that you, uh, is being introduced, but also the social class of the person. So it can really help when it comes to the court intrigue aspect to this one. So as I said, it's very much court intrigue fantasy, but I would say don't expect it to be like, um, a suspenseful plot where you're like constantly seeing courtiers backstab one another. On the whole, it's very much a wholesome story. There is some scheming going on, but it's it's like a lower priority, I would say, within the book. Most of the focus of the book is on this character gaining confidence, learning how to be a good emperor, and um, you know, learning to build relationships with others and to allow others to show him that he is a good person, that he is worthy, that he, um, that the image that he has of himself is not the image that they have. Uh, and so, yeah, I very much love this one a whole lot, but once again, there are some issues and there were also for me personally some issues with the ending because I don't like a closed ending. And so the final 30 pages to me felt redundant. Um, and so that means that I kind of ended on a little bit of a meh feeling again, which endings are really important to me. And so they can really make or break a book. And it did not break this book, but it definitely kind of broke my super excitement that I was having for it. I was really ready to make this my new obsession until we got to those final 30 pages. But so yeah, I absolutely enjoyed this one, but it is definitely for people who like a more slow burn uh, story, who love slow progression of the plot and who don't need thrills and frills. They don't need too much excitement in the plot neither to be able to have a good time. Um, as I said, it's a very much a slow build of one character. And so in terms of character study, in hindsight, I feel like, wow, this was great character work. I never really felt in the moment like we were so heavily working on character development, but as you look back on the story, it's a really great character progression story. All right, so final day of the month and I have two books to update you guys on. So first up, I read Nettle and Bone by T. Kingfisher. So this is described as a dark fairy tale, but it is like a wholesome dark fairy tale. The dark fairy tale aspect is in the world in which we're having the story take place. So this world is very much a dark world we have cannibalism take place within this one. We have domestic abuse taking place. There is necromancy. There are tons of elements that make this one a dark fairy tale, but the overall tone is very much wholesome. So in this one, we are following the third daughter of the king and queen of a kingdom. And this kingdom is kind of in a weak position. So there are two bigger kingdoms that are basically at their footsteps. And so they align with one of these kingdoms by marrying off their oldest daughter. Then when the oldest daughter dies shortly afterwards, the second daughter takes her place. And so we are following the third daughter. She's kind of sent off to a convent so that she cannot really be, she cannot produce a rival to the throne, so to speak. However, as the story progresses, she starts to have her suspicions about this alliance. So I really enjoyed this one a whole lot. It is very much a fast paced read. It was an easy read to get through. I liked the atmosphere. I loved some of the thematics that we were discussing. Uh, and you know, I had a great time with this one. I would say it's like, it's not my new favorite book or anything like that, but I definitely had a great time with it. And it definitely made me want to pick up more Chi King Fisher in the future. Um, it also has like nice humor throughout. It has like a demon possessed chicken, for example, a dog made out of bones who really is a very endearing character. And as I said, it's a wholesome, dark fairy tale. I very much like wholesome fantasy type stories. And this one definitely fits the bill. And then the final book that I read in the month of August, no, not 
<laughs> not August. The final book that I read in the month of July is for The Howling Pack, a book club by Sasha from The Wild Sasha, and we read The Unspoken Name by A.K. Lockwood. So this is a um, lesbian orc story, basically. So we're following this character called Xorway, and basically she's destined to be sacrificed to her god at the age of like 14 or something like that. So she has been prepared for this role all of her life. However, when the time comes, somebody offers her a way out and she takes it. So this one is very much fast paced, super fast paced read. It's like over 500 pages long, but it definitely never felt like a chore to pick this one up. It was always a fun time, a great time. I flew through the pages with this one and I really enjoyed it a whole lot. However, it is also not one that's going to stick with me for a very long time. I enjoyed the story, I enjoyed the characters, but the characters aren't necessarily like super memorable or we don't dive into so much character depth or character evolution that this would stand out for me in a couple of months, a couple of years time. Aside from that, the world building, I would have liked to see elaborated a little bit more. I like the brutality of this world, for example, and the gods in this world, for example, are definitely super dark and sort of like, you know, lacking empathy a whole lot. But also there's this sort of like reference to the world being a dying world and parts of this world are referred to as, as if they have already died, for example. And then there's this sort of idea of the maze, which is this sort of like portal system running through this world. And like, I feel like there's so much there that we haven't explored yet that I find that I found to be really intriguing and that I hope we get more of in the second book. But what mainly is my problem with the world building is that we are following orcs so our protagonist at the very least is an orc, but the only sort of thing that really refers to that is the fact that she has tusks. And I really enjoyed the presence of tusks and the way that we play with that to some extent in the plot at one point and to way that which and the way in which we describe how, you know, they might decorate their tusks and that some people might just forgo any type of decoration as a sort of way to express their personality. But I would have loved to see a whole lot more done with the fact that these aren't humans, we aren't following humans. And it was unclear to me whether the different parts of the world that we were following, whether all of those characters are also orcs or orc-like creatures, what the differences are um, aside from the religions that they are following, for example. And so I felt like it was a missed opportunity to really imbue the story with orc culture, for example. So yeah. I did definitely enjoy this one a whole lot. I would definitely highly recommend it as a sort of like fast paced fancy story that you can really dig your teeth into and you, you'll have a fun time with this one. But if you're looking for like great character work or a deep world to dive into, then this one might fall a little bit short on that front. But so yeah, I definitely did enjoy it. It had its problems for me, but overall, uh, as I said, I do want to continue on and read the second one within this one because that's also an advantage. This is just a duology. But so yeah, that is my reading for the month. Those are all the books that I read. Overall, I feel like I had a good month. You know, I was at times feeling like I wasn't getting any reading done, but that's mainly just because this month has really been one of those months in which I've just been feeling like reading because of Zero TBR being done. I was like, oh, now I can pick up whatever and I want to read whatever. I wanted to read all of the books and I just didn't have the time to read all of them and so I ended up sometimes feeling like I was reading nothing but I definitely did read quite a bit during this month so I'm very happy with the way that the July month went. Um, in terms of books I don't know how well I structured the hauling versus reading within this month because you know there was just so much hauling this month that it made it a little bit more difficult to keep track of those things throughout the month but so in any case at the end of the month my tbr is down to 26 books i say it's down to 26 books it is up by 26 books because of course at the end of june it was at zero but so 26 is perfectly fine i am happy to keep it around that number i would like to see it go down a little bit more i would love to have it closer to the 20 mark but i'm still very happy with having it under 30 but so yeah hope you guys enjoyed this video see you guys for the next one and let me get my august reading started bye <laughs>